Welcome to the new Afghanistan, where America's war on terror collides head on with the war on drugs. You can't look for lily white purity in Afghanistan. It doesn't exist by our standards. To be a leader, an effective leader in Afghanistan, at some point in your life, you had to have been involved in the commission of atrocities, the accumulation of enormous wealth. And that wealth comes from? In Afghanistan, either uh, monopoly sets or, or opium. This is the story of two warlords I first met in 2002, when an American victory seemed near and the demoralized Taliban was surrendering in droves. The two warlords were key American allies whose drug trafficking and human rights abuses were conveniently ignored. Their fate now serves as an apt metaphor for the erratic conduct of Washington's secret war in Afghanistan. Warlord number one now faces life in an American prison, while his former partner, Warlord number two, has become Washington's favorite, fated by none other than Barack Obama. I was surprised because he does have a questionable past, but I can't imagine that the president wasn't uh, briefed on who he was meeting with. Today, in the shadow world of narco politics, all roads lead to Kabul. Asking questions about drug trafficking in a war zone, it's easy to make enemies, and not just with the Taliban. So we're protected by a private security team. Okay. Trust is in short supply. Suicide attackers often dress as police. Well, it's now six years since I was last in Kabul, and the city in parts is almost unrecognisable. There seems to be twice as many people, ten times as many cars, and it's become a city of high concrete walls and razor wire. It also has its own unofficial green zone here, a bit like Baghdad. And like Baghdad, people just seem to be gritting their teeth and waiting for the next car bomb or suicide attack. Of course, all this only protects the rich and the powerful. Afghans are bitterly disillusioned with President Ahmed Karzai. The billions in foreign aid have delivered neither security nor prosperity. Just the bog of corruption and narcotics. Many, including the president's own brother, have been implicated, but few are arrested. Now producing 90% of the world's heroin and opium, Afghanistan is a virtual narco state. Drugs fuel half the economy. America's top counter narcotics official here admits he has a problem. To what degree does this narco economy permeate the political leadership? It is uh, pervasive. It is, you know, throughout the, uh, the leadership, uh, I mean, th throughout the economy, throughout the political class. Uh, I don't think anybody disputes that. New mansions, dubbed poppy palaces, have been built upon the opium profits. Hello, how are you? And we're on our way to one such pile, to meet an old acquaintance from 2002. So, Governor, good to see you again. He's since moved on to become America's favorite warlord. His name is Gul Aga Shirzai. Shirzai translates as son of a lion. But these days he's better known as the bulldozer. The ruthlessly efficient former warlord who gets things done. Oh, okay. this is the 
بلدوزر کم بوده از ما بلدوزر دی. For five years now, he's been governor of troubled Nangarhar province, bordering Pakistan. It was a Taliban and opium-growing stronghold, but the bulldozer has wiped out poppy cultivation and taken on the insurgents becoming a national hero in the process. Today he hosts lunch for his tribal brethren, ethnic Pashtun leaders from the Kandahar region, the heart of the Taliban insurgency. Shirzai was going to challenge Hamid Karzai for the presidency in elections this August. But he withdrew after striking a deal that almost guarantees Karzai's re-election and repositions Shirzai as the top power broker. He says the key to his success is to hunt down the foreigners of Al-Qaeda while offering an amnesty for tribal Taliban fighters. <laughs> او د سلح پر ابتا می د قومونو و علمه اکرامو چه تقریبا ز دول زر تالیبان و ملایان پر نگار که دارم بخیلی این مدرسیه لرو ما د قوم دو ملایان و او د قومی سپیجورو پر مشورمو دیر تالیبان را و سره تو پولیس کارز این فرانت ات نایت ای پوتس ایز پیس پروسیس تو ده تست شرزای ایز سدنلی دیسایدد تو ریترن تو ایز پروینشل کپیتل او جلال آباد و ویر گوین ویر ایم It's a 140-kilometre dash at night along a route routinely attacked by the Taliban. But there's a political point scoring behind this apparent recklessness. While President Karzai remains hunkered down in his palace, the bulldozer is seen to be out and about, daring his enemies to take a shot at him, which they often do. This is Charlie One. You're right behind us, yeah? Make sure you inform me of any cars that come up close on your rear, you understand? Okay, okay. This display of bravado is carefully calculated. The journey, decided with just an hour's notice, runs at breakneck speed under the cover of darkness. In Afghanistan, an uneventful trip is a good trip. And there's a huge sense of relief as we swing into the grounds of the bulldozer's palace. Greeted by his youngest sons, Shirzai segues from warrior to family man, with 17 children from three wives. It's all part of the Bulldozer Roadshow. Bulldozer, but she's got missed. No problem. Taliban is in danger. <laughs> it's been a long political journey here for the bulldozer. He first made his name as a Mujahideen commander in the war against the Soviets. In the early 1990s, after the Russians went home, he was appointed governor of the southern region of Kandahar. I said, come inside. Oh, yeah. OK. It's safe here. Yes. <laughs> His was a brutal reign of violence that has now been conveniently forgotten. So you're still very much a fighter, a oh, Mujahideen? Yes. No, there's a remia, there's a remia, no. A leading human rights investigator claims the bulldozer's brutality was a major factor in the rise of the Taliban, who won widespread support by vowing to end the chaos. His demand for Shirzai to be investigated has been ignored. We do know that while he was a governor in Kandahar, he was not able to control individual commanders who were committing serious atrocities. Uh, that, that was raping girls, raping boys, kids, uh, everyday mass killings. We first met Shirzai back in 2002. Backed by US Special Forces, he'd just returned to Kandahar, ousted the Taliban, and installed himself as governor for a second time. As we revealed, 
The bulldozer was part of a controversial deal involving the other warlord in our story, Haji Bashir Nurzai. Nurzai was Afghanistan's most powerful drug lord and leader of a one million strong tribe allied to the Taliban. Nurzai cut a deal with the Americans, agreeing to help track down fugitive Taliban and Al Qaeda leaders. In return, the US turned a blind eye to his narcotics operation. For the US, the priority was catching terrorists. Drugs came a very poor second. The two warlords were happy to help. Chatting on their US supplied satellite phones, it was all pleasantries, never business. Because the business that glued the pair together was an enormous narcotics enterprise. Governor Sherzai, the bulldozer, was allegedly taking his cut of Nurzai's drug operation. The heart of that business lay three hours away in the town of Sangam. Armed with a hidden camera, we entered this former Taliban stronghold. The traffickers assumed we were American special forces. How was business? Had we declared our real identity, it was unlikely that we would have walked out again. Uh, it was a good, good quality, good quality product at the moment. Good quality opium. Bad quality, good quality, most uh, better quality. Yeah. If I want to buy some, how much for a kilo in US dollars? Around eight hundred dollars. Can we see some product and show us some good quality stuff? <laughs> it's no coincidence that since we filmed here, the struggle to control this town in the heart of Taliban opium country has led to some of the heaviest fighting of the war. The United Nations estimates that 500 million US dollars a year in drug profits flow to the insurgents. You said, who do you want to taste it? <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> Sherzai was later sacked as governor amid tribal rivalries. Western and Afghan intelligence officials accused him of amassing a $300 million fortune from the drug trade. But President Karzai refused to investigate. The bulldozer was parachuted in here to run Nangahar. The main allegation is that you got wealthy during your time as governor of Kandahar, taking a percentage of the opium profits from the area. How do you, how do you respond to that allegation? <laughs> But there was no soft landing for his old associate. Haji Bashir Nurzai took arguably the biggest risk of his life. He flew straight into the lair of the infidel, New York City. He was one of the world's most wanted narcotics traffickers. But somehow he'd swallowed assurances that he wouldn't be touched for the right information. Still, it must have been a stomach-churning ride to a meeting with intelligence officers at this Manhattan hotel. He has, for at least the last 20 years, been dedicated in varying degrees to working for and with the United States in Afghanistan, working as he understood it uh, uh, with CIA funds and sometimes with CIA uh, individuals. In a room with a view of ground zero, where the Twin Towers once stood, Nurzai coughed up what he thought his hosts wanted, intelligence for their war on terror but he'd been duped by an elaborate sting. His hosts, pictured with him here, were not the agents he thought they were, but contractors 
working for America's counter-narcotics agency, the Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA. Nulzai was no longer an asset, but a target. He was charged with conspiracy to import $50 million worth of heroin. Today's arrest of heroin warlord Bashir Norzai is a huge victory for Afghanistan and the United States in the fight against international narcotics trafficking. This veteran of Washington's covert wars had just been king hit by America's wildly spinning moral compass. Norzai's high profile attorney claims it was a controversial takedown. He says Nulzai was lured to New York by a mysterious private company called Rosetta. While it was a DEA-run sting, he claims Rosetta's real masters were then Defence Secretary Donald Rumsfeld and his deputy, Paul Wolfowitz. So Rosetta was a kind of private enterprise CIA working to the Defence Secretary. Hopefully a competent CIA, as opposed to the one according to Wolfowitz, uh, uh, that uh, it had offices a few miles away. So yes, that was the idea. This was going to do things that couldn't be done through regular channels. Bribing public officials in order to establish introductions to people who ultimately introduce you to one of these high value target people Nulzai's New York arrest offered a brief glimpse into the strange interdependent world of drug trafficking and intelligence. In 2007, with the insurgency and drug production spinning out of control, Thomas Schweik was appointed the Bush administration's special ambassador for counter-narcotics. His brief? To sort out the mess in Afghanistan. It is shocking. It's shocking when you first get there to realize that everybody you're dealing with has been part of a gruesome 30 years of war, a civil war, fighting tribal rivalries, rivalries with neighbors. It's just not a world that most of us in the West have ever encountered before. Uh, so you have to do the best you can. In targeting one warlord, it appears the Americans were prepared to ignore the crimes of another. We've obtained hundreds of pages of documents from the Rosetta operation to snare Nulzai. This secret 2004 Pentagon report accused Nulzai of directly bribing Gulag Ashurzai and of handling $500 million of Taliban leader Mullah Omar's money. In another document, Nulzai himself made detailed allegations of drug trafficking and collaboration with the Taliban against many in the Afghan leadership, including Washington's favourite warlord, Gulag Ashurzai. All this material was ruled off limits during Nulzai's New York trial. Ashurzai was involved in the obtaining and keeping of power. In that, Afghanistan, what does that mean? In Afghanistan, that means that you are uh, probably quite ruthless and capable of enormous violence and uh, a very, very ugly forms of it. Um, one, one way or another, uh, you're involved with opium. Shirzai's splendid Jalalabad Palace is a heavily guarded island of tranquility. The bulldozer claims Nangarhar province is now poppy free and safe. But in Afghanistan, security is a relative concept. Last year, two Australian journalists, Stephen DuPont and Paul Raphael, we're here witnessing Shirzai's opium eradication team in action 
when they were wounded in a suicide attack that killed more than 20 Afghans. You can see the carnage behind me. I was very close to the actual bombing. Um, and uh, all I remember is an incredibly loud explosion. Today, the Americans take no chances. Generally, the province is pretty safe, but we did have an attack last month that uh, killed four of, my, uh, my, four of my guys. The bulldozer is officially reopening an irrigation system rebuilt with American money. Washington believes he's delivered that most precious commodity, security. In return, the US has invested $140 million in 100 projects across his province. Well, he's a strong leader. He's done a lot of good work for Nangahar. Uh, a lot of talk about whether he may uh, want to move on to bigger and better things. Uh, we'll see how it goes. The governor is, quite literally, a river to his people. This system will provide water to 60,000 villages. The bulldozer's men forced them to abandon poppies for wheat and other crops requiring much more water. Now he's delivered. A man you can do business with. Yeah, he sure is. He's a friend of the coalition. Uh, he's worked very closely with us. We uh, have uh, established a great working relationship throughout the years and uh, expect to continue to do so. It's been easier to shift farmers to that, whether it's wheat or pomegranates or, or saffron. Back in Kabul, U.S. counter-narcotics officials plot the bulldozers' achievements with amazement. Mushroom was grown in sort of the north and the west. Well, if you look at the numbers, it's hard to argue that it has been anything but a success. Going from 18,000 hectares to effectively zero in one year is pretty remarkable. Why has he been able to make it work in Nangaha and you don't have that degree of success anywhere else in the country? What's, yeah. what's the critical factor there? I, I, I wish we knew. <laughs> I wish we could uh, uh, see the same results in other provinces around the country. Gulaga Shirzai previously was governor of Kandahar during a period when the OPM production down there basically spun out of control. And he wasn't mm -hmm. just running Kandahar, he was running four provinces. Well, I, I prefer to look at the results of this year and, um, and what happens next year. Uh, there, there are plenty of fingers to be pointed at uh, what was done in the past. I, I don't want to get into that. Gulag Ashurzai, what kind of man is he? Well, we hear a lot of things. I mean, he obviously, like many Afghan warlords, has a, a background uh, that's uh, kind of shaky. He's a man who craves attention, who wants to be perceived as a hero in Afghanistan. He's very politically ambitious, but he's also pretty brave. He's willing to make some tough decisions and crack down on people who are powerful in order to get that recognition. I think there's a perception among the West that uh, he's somebody who can be rehabilitated, though, who can be brought around. Shirzai's rehabilitation received its biggest boost last August, when then-Senator Barack Obama visited Afghanistan. Obama initially bypassed President Karzai, heading first for a briefing from the bulldozer. <laughs> this is exactly what they crave too, Mark. They want recognition. The more recognition you give these warlords as having improved their country, uh, the more they will do things that we like. But rather clearly defined capability. President Obama is now sending an extra 21,000 troops to Afghanistan to train terrorists. Part of his new strategy for victory that also targets traffickers. The economy is undercut by a booming narcotics trade that encourages criminality and funds the insurgency. The people of Afghanistan seek the promise of a better future. The tragedy is that it's taken nearly eight years for America's generals to acknowledge what was obvious from the first day their troops marched through the opium poppy fields. They're such pretty flowers. The drugs, the Taliban, and the corrupt Afghan leadership are all linked. So colorful. Right. Was it perhaps one of the biggest errors made strategically in dealing with oh, Afghanistan? I think so, absolutely, because the people were fighting get significant resources from the drug trade. And we should have known that because the Taliban in the 1990s took money from the drug trade. But this new get tough strategy has its limits. 
The party won't be ending anytime soon for Gulag Ashurzai. The new Afghanistan needs strong leaders. Is the national interest best served by fighting the drug people or working with them? <laughs> and now we see in Shurzai's example, um, the pendulum is going back to the practical approach. The swing of the pendulum has knocked out Haji Bashir Nulzai. Held in his Manhattan jail for four years, he was recently sentenced to life behind bars. We do have to make judgments there. And I think that if you look at the totality of the evidence, there was a much stronger case against Norzai as somebody we really shouldn't be dealing with who does need to serve some time in prison versus Shurzai. Make us all aware of the brevity of life. Coalition soldiers have been farewelling the fallen since 2001. Nearly 1,200 have now died in Afghanistan, including 10 Australians. Our comrade, our friend. Haji Bashir Norzai's imprisonment did nothing to diminish the opium trade nor the insurgency. And his lawyer ponders on what might have been. Whenever on television there is a story about our guys being killed, I ask myself, would their lives have uh, been saved had Haji Bashar been free to pursue the joint effort he came here to establish? We'll probably never know.